On March 17, 2005, while hiking the Lone Mountain Trail in Carson City, a passerby noticed a protruding shoe from the ground and promptly alerted authorities. Upon investigation, law enforcement discovered the buried remains of a woman wrapped in a sleeping bag. Preliminary estimates suggested that the woman had passed away approximately a year before her unearthing. Despite the standard identification procedures, investigators were unable to determine her identity, and she became a Jane Doe. In 2019, the Carson City Sheriff's Office turned to the DNA Doe Project to employ genetic genealogy in their efforts to unveil the identity of the Jane Doe. This involved utilizing DNA matches to construct her family tree. Following a series of intricate laboratory processes to extract and translate DNA into a usable profile for comparison with millions of database records, volunteer investigative genetic genealogists began their work. By May 2020, the DNA Do Project reported that more than 13 volunteers had diligently collaborated to link matches with family trees reaching back to ancestors born in the mid 1700s in England. The exhaustive effort took just under a year to narrow down the search to a single family in the expansive family tree. Three out of the six siblings were women, and investigators were prompted to pursue this lead. In October 2022, a family member of Jane Doe's ancestry underwent a DNA test, and the results were uploaded to GEDmatch.com, a public database accessible for law enforcement cases. Following this DNA match, Investigators conclusively identified Jane Doe as Joyce A. Rogers Anus, originally from Michigan. Aside from furnishing this pivotal lead for identification, the DNA Doe Project team also supplied details about a man connected to Joyce, who later admitted to burying her body on Lone Mountain. It emerged that 72-year-old Joyce had succumbed to natural causes, and her husband, Edward Barton, had interred her on the mountain. The couple, being homeless and financially strapped, lacked the means for a proper funeral. Regrettably, there exists no way to substantiate or refute Edward Barton's account of events, and the case is presently considered resolved. In Granby, Massachusetts, on November 15, 1978, a group of kids playing off Amherst Street made a grim discovery an unidentified woman's body buried under a pile of leaves. Investigators later determined that she had been fatally shot in the temple and that her body had been dragged using a man's belt. Her demise occurred approximately three months before the discovery, around August 1978. Sadly, despite efforts, investigators were unable to identify her and she became known as Granby Girl, eventually laid to rest in a local cemetery with a headstone marked unknown. In a significant turn of events, on March 6, 2023, the Northwest District Attorney's Office convened a news conference at the Granby Police Station to reveal a breakthrough in the case. It was disclosed that the remains found in 1978 belonged to 28-year-old Patricia Ann Tucker, born on July 28, the 1950. First Assistant District Attorney Stephen G. explained that advances in DNA technology enabled them to locate Patricia's half-sister in Maryland, who subsequently led them to Patricia's son. At the time of her disappearance, he was just five years old. Stephen G. remarked, although it's satisfying to finally identify who Granby Girl was, our investigation won't cease until we pinpoint the individual responsible for taking her life, providing the family with an additional measure of closure and justice. This investigation, spanning decades, will persist until every possible lead is thoroughly explored. In 1978, Patricia, formerly known by the married names Patricia Heckman, Patricia Dale, and later Patricia Coleman, lived with her husband Gerald Coleman on the shore of Lake Pocatopog in East Hampton, Connecticut. Strangely, Coleman never reported his wife missing and passed away in a Massachusetts prison in 1996. Stephen G. now considers Coleman a person of interest in Patricia's case. For those with information about the case, 
please contact Granby Police at 413-467-9222 or email Dwight at granbop.org. Patricia's son, Matthew Dale, now 50 years old, shared his recollections of his mother during a recent interview. The memories date back to 1978 when Patricia was seated in the front of a stranger's car, donning a vest. Matthew, positioned on plush upholstery in the back seat, was accompanied by a man he did not recognize behind the wheel. Despite the passage of time, Matthew vividly remembers his mother's last words before her disappearance, instructing him to go across the street to the playground, adjacent to a juvenile group home. Patricia bid him farewell with a simple goodbye now. As Matthew reflects on his middle-aged years, his memories have become somewhat hazy. To the best of his recollection, the facility was located outside Boston. His father retrieved him the following day and assumed the role of his primary caregiver after Patricia's departure. Despite spending most of his life in North Carolina and establishing a happy family life, Matthew has been haunted by the unresolved mystery of his mother's disappearance. Within the family, rumors circulated, with some speculating that Patricia might have entered the Federal Witness Protection Program. It wasn't until Matthew reached his 30s that he came to terms with the likelihood that his mother was no longer alive. Dispelling myths surrounding her, he noted, my mother fell in with the wrong crowd. She was not a hiker, like some of the stories said through the years. I've been told so many lies about it. Following his father's passing in 2015, Matthew has grappled with a sense of aimlessness, despite being happily married, a father, and a longtime union electrician. Several weeks prior to the identification, the police arrived at his doorstep. They questioned him, revealing that they had located him through his uncle in a DNA database, mentioning Granby Girl. Puzzled, Matthew wondered. What is Granby Girl State Police investigators, though sparing on details, indicated they had presumed Patricia's body? Having previously submitted his DNA to a database in anticipation of his mother's potential identification, Matthew promptly forwarded investigators a file containing his digital DNA profile. Within hours, they contacted him by phone, confirming a clear genetic match. Matthew possesses only a few mementos of his mother, a solitary photo baby books she crafted for him, a lock of his hair, and a small tapestry she painted during his childhood. He intends to organize a proper grave for his mother, which has long been marked only by a wooden cross. In 1998, Granby residents contributed funds to establish a more dignified marker, as recalled by Matthew. Reflecting on the tragic end, he expressed his desire to commission a new gravestone for her, stating she deserves to have her name on it. In July 1980, authorities discovered the remains of an unidentified man in a wooden crate in the Chicago Greater Area Sanitary and Shipping Canal. The crate, containing the body, had been extracted using heavy equipment, along with other debris from a grate designed to prevent objects from entering the power plant. During the removal and disposal process by power plant employees, the crate broke open. A couple of days later, an employee searching for driftwood stumbled upon the body, but advanced decomposition made identification challenging. Upon autopsy, investigators found evidence that the unknown man had been deliberately taken from this world. He had sustained a shotgun wound to the abdomen and multiple gunshot wounds from a handgun. It was deduced that the man had likely lost his life several days before the discovery of his body. Investigators approximated that the unidentified white male was between 25 and 35 years old at the time of his demise. They estimated his height at 5'11 and weight at around 175 lbs. The man had light brown to blonde hair, approximately 2 inches in length when discovered. He was dressed in dark blue work pants marked with J5, a green pullover t-shirt with a pocket, wool socks, and a single dark-colored herringbone house slipper. Although partial fingerprints were recovered from the body, attempts to match them with individuals in both state and federal databases were unsuccessful. Dental evidence was also obtained but did not correspond to any known missing persons. For more than four decades, 
Law enforcement tirelessly pursued leads to uncover the identity of an unknown man. In November 2009, his case was entered into the National Missing and Unidentified Person System, NamUs, and despite STR testing, no match to anyone was found. Despite the exhaustive efforts of law enforcement, the man's identity remained elusive and the case eventually went cold. In 2022, the Will County Coroner's Office, in collaboration with AAM, opted to utilize forensic genetic genealogy in an attempt to establish the man's identity or find a close relative. The Will County Coroner's Office committed substantial funding to the testing, with the remainder crowdfunded through DNA Solve's platform. Skeletal evidence was sent to AAM resulting in the development of a suitable DNA extract. Ah! AM scientists employed forensic-grade genome sequencing to construct a comprehensive DNA profile, and AME's in-house genetic genealogy research team utilized this profile to generate investigative leads. These leads were then provided to law enforcement. A subsequent investigation, along with confirmation DNA testing of a family member, conclusively identified the 1,980 victim as Webster Pfizer born on September 25, 1950. On March 22 and 2023, the Will County Coroner's Office officially identified the remains as those of 29-year-old Webster from Chicago. Sergeant Mike Ernest acknowledged, obviously, there were numerous mob-related crimes during that era, and many of them extended into Will County. Is it a possibility we will explore? Yes, it is. However, I cannot say for certain at this point. Webster's wife recently informed investigators that her husband had left home in mid-July 1980 to buy cigarettes at a gas station, approximately a block away, but never returned. Webster was eventually reported missing to the Chicago Police Department by concerned relatives. Joe Piper, a deputy coroner and cold case investigator at the Will County Coroner's Office, expressed, this gentleman is somebody's father, somebody's uncle, somebody's brother, and it is gratifying to provide the family with some form of closure because they are searching and wondering whatever happened to their loved one. Those with information that could assist in this case are urged to contact the Will County Coroner's Office at 815 727 8455